All right. Now, this is nothing to do with the sermon, but since we're in Isaiah 59, this is a great passage. You might want to highlight this or pay, pay note of this. Uh, we're a King James only Baptist church. We believe that King James Bible is, is the preserved word of God in the English language. And this is just one more passage that, that you can turn to to explain. You know, when, when you're trying to explain to someone that tells you, oh, but there's always you know, problems in the text. You know, when you go and translate things, you have, you have different issues and nothing can ever be kept perfect and things are lost in translation and whatever. You know, all the things that people will say. Well, and at the end of Isaiah 59, there, the last verse, God, I mean, look, everything in the Bible is true. God's word is true. God doesn't fail on his promises. And when he says something is going to happen, and that's the way it's going to be, he says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. So this is God speaking. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. So he's saying the words that I give you right now that you're going to be speaking, that you're going to be preaching, Isaiah, these are going to come out of your mouth, they're going to come out of your children's mouth, they're going to come out of your children's children's mouth from, from henceforth, from now, even forever. So in order for God's words that he's given unto Isaiah to be preached forever, I mean, they have to still be around today. That's right. Otherwise, this wouldn't be true. And, and in order for God's words, they have to be accurate. I mean, you can't just say, oh, well, this is kind of what he meant. No, his words that he gave him is still be. And look, nobody's going back to the old Hebrew and, and using that language anymore that, that this was, book was written in to say, oh, well, it has to be in that language. No, it doesn't. These words are still being spoken and preached and taught today as we're in the book of Isaiah this morning here at Word of Truth. But anyways, that has nothing to do with the sermon at all. It's just, it's just a great thing that, you know, to highlight, make note of whenever you, you come into contact with someone who's not familiar or doesn't understand the concept of why we believe that God's Word is preserved. There is scripture backing up the preservation of God's Word, and that's just one of the references. But what, I wanna, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is this common misconception that many people have, and it's not just in, you know, like, false believing Christian churches, but even in many Baptist churches, you're going to find people who will say that, you know, when a person dies that's not saved, that they suffer this separation from God. They'll call it going to hell as being separated from God. And that is simply not true. And I'm going to prove that to you from Scripture this morning. So we started off in Isaiah chapter 59 because this is probably the only place that you can turn to in the whole Bible to try to teach that you know going to hell or something is separation from God. And we're going to look at it. It's right at the beginning of the chapter there. Let's look at the verses here, verses 1, 2, and 3. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath uttered, muttered perverseness. And it goes on and on about how wicked and sinful they were being in the rest of that chapter. But what we see here is that, okay, their iniquities, and he's talking to the children of Israel this time, right? His chosen people. It says that their iniquities have separated, they, they've caused a, a problem between them and God. And this is absolutely true. But what I want to point out is we're going to look at this, at this passage in context to see exactly what it's saying and not apply it to something else that's just completely false. Now, when we sin, when we have problems with God, yeah, there's a problem, and, God, and that'll hurt our relationship with God. And what, what you always have to keep in, memory, in, in mind when you read the Bible is that there's not everything is talking about salvation, first of all. I preach an entire sermon uh, called Two Types of Forgiveness that, that goes over the forgiveness that like, a nation will receive, Versus the forgiveness an individual receives, you know, when it comes to salvation and stuff. And a lot of times people who teach false doctrine and work salvation will go back, especially to the Old Testament scriptures, and they'll turn to Ezekiel and they'll say, see, you've got to turn from all of your wickedness and turn from your sins and everything else in order to receive your salvation. But that's not what the passages are talking about. When Jonah went and preached 
to the, to the city of Nineveh, saying, yet 40 days, God's going to destroy this place. And then they repented. They, they, they turned from their evil ways, the Bible says. They did good. You know, they got sad. They mourned. They wept. They fasted to God. We're sorry for doing all these bad things. And then God did not destroy Nineveh. He changed his mind. He says, you know what? My plan, I was going to go forward. I was going to destroy this city. I was going to bring the judgment of their wickedness upon them. But because they humbled themselves, because they said we're not going to do these things anymore, and they changed their ways. Now look, when you change your ways, that's works. I mean, you're, you're changing from bad works to doing good works. That does not save a person's soul. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's all throughout the Bible. You could find that time after time after time, that salvation is by grace through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, since He paid for all of our sins. But then you come at a passage like that, and people say, well, wait a minute, what happened? And in Jonah 3.10, you know, the Bible tells us that God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil he thought to do unto them. So God repented. God changed his mind when he saw their good works. And it goes that way all throughout the Bible. In order for a nation to survive, in order for a group of people to, to survive and not suffer the judgment of God's wrath and, and for God not to you know, bring them into captivity and have all these problems come upon them, they need to obey God's laws. They need to keep His commandments. They need to be doing righteousness. They need to be doing what's right and not getting off into all of these sins. But that is not the way that a person individually gets saved. So when we look at this passage and you see, see, look, their iniquities have separated between you and your God, you can't just all of a sudden take that and say, well, that just means that once someone dies and goes to hell, that they're eternally separated from God. That's not what that means. You, can't, you cannot go and extrapolate that doctrine out of that. To get this passage even in more context, let's look back to chapter 58 because... It's not like all these chapters are completely standalone. This is an entire book of the Bible. They all run together. All the chapters run together. Look at Isaiah 58. We're going to start reading in verse number 9. We'll get more of a context. The Bible reads, Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise, rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So in the previous chapter, he's saying, look, if you're doing what's right, if you do what's good, he says, then you'll call on me, and I'll hear you. I'll be there for you. I'll listen to you. I'll make your souls fat. When the drought comes, hey, I'll make sure that you're fed. When bad times happen, I will be there for you. That's exactly what he's saying. And he contrasts chapter 58 with all of those good and the blessings and saying, you do what's right, here I am. I'll listen to you. My ear's wide open. He said, you'll call and I'll answer. And that's why chapter 59 starts off with, but if you're not going to do these things, if you're going to do what's bad, then I won't listen. And verse 1 and 59 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that, is, that it cannot hear. It's not like God's ear... Is just he just can't handle all the prayers and all the requests and everyone you know coming to him. It's not that he's burdened in some way by hearing the people's prayers, and that's what he's saying. You know, it's not that God's ear is heavy, but in verse two, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So God decides, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to you because you aren't listening to me. God's given us the commandments. He's given us his people, his children, his commandments. He said, this is what I want you to do. Now, this only makes perfect sense when you see this here. What parent, what father is going to, if their children are just not listening to what they say at all, just, just completely ignoring everything that they tell them to do, but then your child saying, oh, dad, give me this, give me that that you're just going just gonna to do everything that they ask you to do and just listen to everything that they say. Of course you're not going to do that. You're going to say, no, 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 no. You've got it backwards. First, you listen to me. First, you do what I'm telling you to do. 
and then maybe I'll be pleased and then I could, uh, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say and listen to your requests and help you out when you need it. But until then, you know, you're bringing this problem upon yourself. Don't come running to me when you go and, and, and not listen to anything I have to say and you have getting in trouble for it. You know, you're going to have to reap what you sow. And this is the way that God is dealing with his people. And that's exactly what this means here is that, you know, our relationship, our iniquities, our sins as born again believers in Jesus Christ. If we go off into sin, if we go off into iniquity, guess what? God's not going to hear your prayers. He's not going to listen to you. He's going to say, you know what you're supposed to be doing. I've already told you, and you're not listening to me. I'm not going to listen to you. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means that you've, been, you, you know, you've, you've allowed your sin to get in the way of your good relationship with God. Right. And that's exactly what that means. And that's what this verse means in the context. I mean, I don't see how you could read that any other way unless you have a different agenda that you want to try to teach out of this. Now, turn, if you would, to... Hebrews, or actually turn if you would to Psalm 139. I'll read for you from Hebrews 12. Now, we're going to get into a lot more proof text as to, you know, being separated from God is, has nothing to do with people in hell. You know, people who are, are in hell are not just eternally separated from God. That is just a false statement to make. That's actually something that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach and believe is that it's an eternal separation from God. I was talking to one because they don't believe in a literal, a literal like fiery hell. They believe in, in this doctrine where you're just annihilated. Where it's just, you know, when God sends you to hell that pff, like you just are completely destroyed and that your, your soul, everything, you just completely cease to exist. And, you know, I, I've talked with many Jehovah's Witnesses out so and I try to explain, I say, well, well, how do you explain these passages that say, you know, being tormented and tortured and, you know, and I go to Revelation 14, which we'll be doing later in this chapter, in this, in this sermon, and, and say, you know, the smoke of their torment, or, you know, they have no the rest day or night, and, you know, and it goes on and on about the torture and, you know, and the pain that's going on in hell. How can you say that when they just cease to exist? And they say, oh, well, because they're separated from God, so that is torture. Just not being in the presence of God is torture in itself. And they try to, to play the words that way. And it's like, no, this is obviously talking about physical pain. I mean, this is talking about being in a flame of fire. And, they, and you know, they try to make it sound like it's, um, it's all just a metaphor. But you may not believe Jehovah's Witness doctrines. Well, I hope you don't. I mean, you're in a Baptist church. But there's a lot of Baptist churches that are going around and, and, and getting real watered down on this subject. Yeah. Because I think a lot of it is they're afraid to, to offend somebody by talking about hell. By saying that, you know what? It's really bad. There's judgment. There's torture. There's torment. And they try to water it down and say, well, you're going to be separated from God. It might be easier to swallow that way. But look, we're not, I, I'm not, I don't feel like I have better judgment than God has and that I need to change, you know, to make what God said a little bit easier to swallow. I'm going to preach it the way it's said, the way, the way the Bible says it is because I'm not better than he is and I don't have better understanding than God has. And we need to hear what hell really is about. Now, in Hebrews 12, 28, and this, is, this has to go with also understanding who God is. When you get a clear picture and a vivid understanding of what hell, when you, when you start reading these passages, and we will, we're going to go through many passages that talk about hell this morning. Make it a reality. It's so easy to read over the scripture to get kind of a head knowledge, like you read it and you understand it. But when you really ponder on it, and try to imagine the place and think about what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? You know, and, and almost put yourself there, right? When you really make it real and, and, and it becomes something that, that is, wow. People have a hard time with that because it flies in the face of everything that they've heard about God in many cases. They'll think, well, isn't God love? And people have a hard time with that. And I talk to many people that they don't understand. They say, well, wait a minute. How does a loving God send someone to hell? How does a loving God do these things? How, what do you mean your God is love? How, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But it makes perfect sense. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish forever, everlasting, everlasting life. And see, what people fail to understand is that God's given us free will. He's given us the choice to do whatever we want to do. 
which in and of itself is, is an excellent gift. We're not just robots. He did not just make us to do everything that he said to do and just we have no choice in the matter and that we're just going to blindly obey. No, he says, you're a creature. You could decide whatever you want to do. We're the ones who get ourselves into trouble. We're the ones that sin. We're the ones that do harm to other people. We're the ones that do things that are wicked and wrong and evil. So when a judgment is going to come up, a just judgment is going to come upon us for being disobedient, for not doing what's right, for, for, for sinning, we can't blame God for that. God actually is love because he has made it so easy to get saved. He says, all you got to do is believe. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says, and that is why God is so loving. But there's another aspect of God that people need to understand, that he's not just, you know, and this is perfect with the, the sermon Pastor Man has preached recently, is that it's not, um, you cannot have love if you don't have some form of hatred. You know, there, th these things are, are, are um, you know, there's a spectrum. And in order to love something <clears throat> completely, there has to be something that you hate. You know, for example, well, I love my kids so much. Well, I hate the person that's going to come and defile my children. I mean, I hate that. I hate everything to do with that. God loves righteousness and, and equity, and he loves things that are, you know, goodness. So he hates every wicked way. He hates everything that's false. He hates everything that's bad. There's a heaven and there's a hell. You know, there's good, there's evil. This is the way that reality works, and this is the way that God is. God has love, but God also has wrath. God is not just all... Because think about that. What, how meaningless would love be if there was no, nothing opposite of that? I mean, if just, well, just God just loves everyone. You can just do anything at any time, and God just loves you equally, and God loves everybody the same, and it's just everything, you know, that's nonsense. It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. There has to be, um, you know, different levels, and it's, and it's based on everything here. So um, in Hebrews 12, 28, the Bible says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. It's an aspect of God that we need to be mindful of. Our God is a consuming fire. We need to serve him with reverence, respect God, be very humble, and godly fear. God is all-powerful, and every single man in the Bible, great godly men who has ever been in the presence of the Lord, have all fallen down in fear and trembling and quaking at just being in the presence of God Almighty. And again, you may have never been in the presence of God Almighty, just like I haven't been physically as Moses was. But when you read the scripture, put yourself in the situation and be like, yeah. I mean, and, and the best way that, that I could imagine that is if you've ever been in a really, really, really bad storm or so, you know, some, you know, like a tornado or hurricane or something where you're not in control and nobody's in control and by the grace of God, you'll get out alive. Those are the types of situations where you realize how helpless you really are and how weak you really are and how strong and powerful God really is. And, and usually it takes something like that to realize, whoa, okay. Because we go through day to day and you start getting proud and lifting up and thinking, well, nothing ever happens to me. Everything's going great. I've got, you know, everything's going good. And that's when, you're, when your pride lifts, you, lifts yourself up into you thinking you're invincible, right, and immortal and, and you don't need anybody or anything when you don't realize how real small and weak you are compared to God. But let's look at Psalm 139 because the fact of the matter is that when you go to hell, you're not separated from God. And this is what I'm trying to teach this morning. We're going to look at scriptures for that. Psalm 139. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is not beholden to just one area, one location. Even when you read about the throne of God in heaven and stuff, that's not the only place where God exists right. or can be found. God is everywhere. And we're going to see this from scripture. Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Oh, wait, what am I? I thought I was separated from God. No, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God is there. Okay? Verse number 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You cannot go anywhere. You cannot flee from God. There is nowhere in heaven or on earth that you can go where God is not there. God sees everything. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 14. 
Hell is not eternal separation from God. God is in hell. God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. Revelation chapter 14. Because not only is God there, God is the one that's dishing out the punishment in hell. God is the one who created hell. That's right. Revelation chapter 14, look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And who's the Lamb? It's Jesus Christ, right? And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And it, this is one Jehovah's Witnesses fumble over all the time because it's like, well, how could they be annihilated if they have no rest day or night and they're, you know, it's this torment is happening continually. And not only is it happening continually, it's happening right in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. Right. The holy angels, Jesus Christ, he's there while you're being tortured and tormented in hell. You're not eternally separated from God. God is the one who create, created hell. Now, maybe a more accurate statement then is that being unsaved makes you separated from God's love. That is much more accurate. If you want to use that phrase, that's perfectly fine because that is accurate and that's true. You're not separated from God, but you're separated from the love of God. Those that are in hell, guess what? God doesn't love them anymore. There was a time when God loved them because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God does not continue to love every single person just for all of eternity. It doesn't happen. If that happened, then it would be, I mean, what, how inconsistent would that be for God to throw someone, I love you, as he's throwing them into the lake of fire, as they're going to be tortured and tormented forever. No, God doesn't do that to people that he loves. He doesn't do that to his children, just like a loving father. Every loving father loves his children. When you're born again, when your spirit's born again, you become a child of God. God loves you. He'll never remove that loving kindness from you. Amen. Praise the Lord for that, which is why you never have to face that punishment of wrath and the, the eternal uh, fire of the Lord. Now, um, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. John 3.36 tells us, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So those that are unbelievers, those that are unsaved, the wrath of God is abiding on them. They are separated from the love of God because their sins had not been forgiven yet. God created hell. Matthew 25, verse 41 reads, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, God originally created hell a long, long time ago for the devil and his angels. Now, Obviously, we then will face the same judgment in our sin. But see, Satan sinned in the Garden of Eden before anyone else did when he was trying to, uh, when he did deceive Eve into eating of the forbidden fruit and, you know, that whole story. So he was the very first one to, uh, to commit any type of sin, the devil and his angels. And then, of course, that judgment falls upon us. The fires of hell are literally kindled by God. And Isaiah, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to... Uh, where's the next place we're going to? Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. In Isaiah 30, verse 33, the Bible reads, For Tophet is ordained of old. Yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. I mean, God is igniting the flames of hell. But it's important for us not just to understand that we're not separated from God in hell, but to understand how, how horrible of a place hell is and that people need to hear about this. You know, people ought to be afraid of going to hell. 
I've, I've, talked, I've talked to a couple people at Soul Wing that have said, oh, well, I don't do anything based off of fear. I think that's a stupid reason. You know, I don't make my decisions based off of fear. Okay, well, that's pretty stupid. Really. I mean, just, so <laughs> you don't make your decisions based off of fear at all. If you were to walk to the, go to the Grand Canyon, just walk to the edge, you know what? You ought to be afraid of getting so close that you're going to fall off the edge, off into the canyon, and die, right? So you ought to be able to base some kind of decision making and say, you know what? I'm not going to get that close because I'm afraid I might fall over. That's a very wise choice to make, and, and to make a decision based off of that fear is excellent. So saying, oh, I don't want to make a decision based off of fear is just stupid and hypocritical anyways. But when you understand the consequences, you say, I'm headed towards hell. Hey, that's, that's a, that is, should be a strong enough reason. People say, oh, well, you should, you should want to be saved because you just want to serve God and you want to have all the proper, you know, it's like, okay, you should have that attitude, but that's not the only reason that, that you should believe on him. There's nothing wrong or, or unspiritual about being scared about going to hell and, and not wanting to go to that place and putting your faith in Christ as a result. Now, we're going to look at the reality of, of hell here in Mark chapter 9 and not some watered down description of just like, oh, it's separation from God. Because think about this, separation from God. To someone that hates God, to someone who wants to have nothing to do with God, to someone who says, well, the God of the Bible, he's, he's a mean God, he's hurtful, everything else. I don't want to have anything to do with him anyways. You tell them, well, you're going to be separated from God. They're going to say, good. I don't want to have anything to do with them. As opposed to telling them, well, you're going to burn in hell forever. Those are two different things. Literally, two different things. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Jesus Christ. And you know what's interesting here? Is that, I mean, this, this whole page of notes that I have, we're, we're going to be looking at the words that Jesus Christ literally spake on this earth. Now, obviously, we know that it doesn't really matter. Jesus Christ is the Word. Jesus Christ embodies all of the words of God. And it's not like anything is contradictory to what Jesus would have taught anyways. But these are all coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Jesus Christ was a hellfire and damnation preacher. Okay, he was not just this, this long-haired hippie that the, you know, Hollywood's going to try to tell you that he was and, and just a total pacifist who never said anything that anyone would get upset over. I mean, they killed him. They nailed him to the cross because they hated the things that he said. But Mark chapter 9, look at verse number 43. He's giving strong, stern warnings about hell. It says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Do you notice the repetition here? He's talking about hell. He says, yeah, and just in case you didn't get it the first time or the second time, I'm going to give it to you a third time, where the worm dieth not. So being eaten of worms, your soul being eaten of worms, the worms don't die. And you know what? You're dead, but you're still existing because your soul is there. And the worms don't die. It says, and the fire is not quenched. The fire never goes out. There's continual burning, no relief whatsoever. Everlasting fire in worms. That's the description he's giving here. And he's telling you, look, it's better for you that you'd cut off your hand or cut off your foot or, or pluck out your own eyeball. I mean, think about the immense pain and suffering that you would feel in this lifetime by plucking out your own eyeball. He says it's way better to do that than to go to hell. You'll be way, 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 way better off to have those types of things happen to you than to burn and be suffering in hell forever where the, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Turn back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to see another, um, another description of hell. We're going to add to this one. So we see the everlasting fire. It never goes out. We see the eating of worms. The worms don't die. Matthew 8 
Verse 11, the Bible reads, And I say unto you, again the words of Jesus, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So weeping is crying, right? I mean, you're going to be people just, just crying and gnashing of teeth, you know, angry and just saying all kinds of horrible things and, and grinding their teeth and gnashing and darkness. And we think of, of fire as bringing light. Well, the fire of hell, now this, and again, I know this is talking about outer darkness. This is talking about um, when, 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 um, Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. I believe that's what this is talking about. But even hell right now in the center of the earth, where the Bible says that hell is, is located in the heart of the earth, there's no light getting down there. So you have fire and flame and fire and brimstone, you know, magma, everything that's just super hot down there, and it's dark. There's no light down there. So when you imagine being in this place of hell, there's worms. There's the everlasting fire. There's that torture of just being burned. And anyone who's been burned knows that that is a really torturous thing to happen when you get burned, even just a little bit. You're engulfed in flames, your whole body. You're, hear, you're, you're hearing everybody else that's down in hell too, weeping, gnashing their teeth, and it's completely pitch black. You can't see anything. You can't even see the flames you're being burned by. Matthew 13, turn there, we're going to hear the, not just the weeping, the crying, the gnashing of teeth, but the Bible says in Matthew 13 that there's wailing. I mean, people just crying out. And, and let's, read the, let's read the passage first. Matthew 13, verse 40. As therefore the, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Being in a furnace of fire. And I, I know this is a horrible thought, but just think for a second. This is a horrible subject. The, the, you know, the subject of hell, it's not, it, 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 it actually instills horror. That's why it's horrible. It's not pleasant to think about. It's not something that you came into church this morning thinking like, hey, it's Sunday morning, we're going to church. And now I'm going to hear about this devastating, horrible place of hell. But it is important. We need to hear about these things. We need to be reminded of it. And we need to realize that this is a real place. Now, think if you would, and I think about, like, my children. Think about a child. Think about someone that you love, someone that you care about. And they are wailing in torture and torment, and there's nothing you can do about it, but you hear them. And you have to just, just hear that going on. You can't stop it, and you're hearing what's going on to them, how, how horrible of a torture that is in and of itself let alone that you are also experiencing the same thing. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 16, because Luke 16 also describes it as a place of torture and torment. Nobody wants their, you know, no one in hell right now wants anyone else they know to go to hell. Nobody does. They don't want to be comforted. They don't want anybody to go through what they are going through. No matter how hardened they were in this life, no matter how proud they were, no matter, you have these people that say, oh, I'm going to go to hell. And they're like proud about it. And they think it's funny and they think it's cool. And they think that I'm going to be, oh, Satan's got me, I'm going to be his right hand man. You're a fool. And people think that and they joke about it. And some people I think are kind of serious. They think, oh, I just, I want to go to hell. You know, they say all those proud words now, but the story changes once they get into hell. It does change because anybody who gets, goes through that type of torture and torment, you're going to be singing a different tune immediately. Immediately. No one is going to be able to keep their pride through any of that. We're going to see here, Luke 16, an example. I believe a real example, not just a parable. I believe it's a real example where Jesus Christ gives the name of a man named Lazarus. A real person. None of the other parables that Jesus taught, he'll even say he taught a parable. The Bible says he taught a parable unto them saying, and he gives this just completely um, symbolic type of a story. This is a story where he talks about a real person. We're going to start reading, though, in verse 23, because it's, it's Lazarus, 
who was this poor beggar and a rich man, right? The rich man had everything great in this life, and Lazarus was poor, and he begged, and he ate the crumbs off the table, and the dogs licked his sores, you know, and everything was going bad for him and good for the rich man. They both died. The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus goes to heaven. Lazarus is saved. Lazarus goes to heaven, and he's being comforted, and everything's great, and the rich man goes to hell, and we're going to read now this story of the rich man in hell to get more of a description of hell and an understanding of what it's really about. Verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He's being tortured. He's like, I am burning up in this flame. Can you at least send that poor, dirty, homeless beggar to dip his finger in water and put one drop on my tongue? I'm willing to, to drink from his hand one drop of water to provide any type of relief or comfort. When you're that tortured and tormented to where you're just asking for one drop to, just to get that relief, I mean, think about how bad things must be. I mean, when you think about how thirsty you've ever been in your life, the most thirsty you've been, did you ever just want a drop of water? No, of course not. I mean, you want, you want to be filled. He is so down and out. And I mean, things are so bad. He's like, just give me one drop. Can I just have one drop of water, please, off of his hand, off of that dirty beggar's hand? Please just give me one drop of water. I'm tormented here. Please help me. One drop. Verse 25, but Abraham said, son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment." There's no getting out of hell. That's probably the worst part of it. Any torture, any pain, anything that you go through in this life, you can always look for an end. There's always some way out. Even if that end is dying physically, there's always some kind of an end. There's an end point. There is no end point to hell. It is eternal, everlasting torture and torment. It never ends. And the people there obviously are aware. They're aware of things. They're able to think. They're able to have thoughts. They're able to think for the rest of their existence in hell of all the things that they've done in their lifetime. They're able to think, man, I was so stupid. Why did I reject God? And not only that, this guy was thinking about his five brothers. He's like, I got five brothers. I don't want them coming here. The last thing I want, if I never see them again, that would be good because I don't want them coming to this place to be tortured with me here. I'd much rather them go to heaven where, where Lazarus is, where Abraham is. And they have to live with that in hell, knowing that there's nothing they could do. They're helpless to change the fate of anybody that's still alive on earth. And in many cases, they're going to be thinking... Now, and, and I often think about this too. We go out soul winning sometimes and people will, will come up and you know, we'll be talking to maybe someone who's a little bit younger or we'll be talking to, so, to a husband or to a wife and then another person will come and just say, come on in here and just, and just completely destroy our opportunity to get that person saved. They're listening, they're, they're interested, they want to hear, but then someone else comes along, they slam the door shut and they stop you cold in your tracks. Now what if that's the only opportunity that they ever have and then that person goes to hell and they're going to be thinking now because now they're going to realize how real it is. And that's going to be on their mind forever. Not only do they have the physical torture and torment, they're going to have that mental torment of, I caused my loved one to be here with me. There is no comfort that they're going to receive from their friends and family being there with them because all they're going to be hearing is their weeping and their wailing and their gnashing of teeth. You're not going to be sitting, they're not going to be sitting down in hell just having a conversation and having a tea party or something as they're being tortured and tormented. There is a separation that goes on from your saved relatives when people go to hell, but there's not a separation from God. This is the reason why we cannot be slack concerning the Great Commission. This is why this church started here a little less than three years ago. 
Because nobody is going out and preaching the right gospel of Jesus Christ to the community and to this, just to everyone in this whole area. Nobody's going out and doing it. And people are dying and going to hell as a result because Christians, believers, are not bearing the precious seed and going out and telling people how easy it is to get saved, but they need to believe on Jesus Christ. Nobody's doing it, and it's not happening. Look, if nobody is preaching the gospel, then people aren't getting saved. That's right. It's the bottom line. That's right. It needs to happen. Jude, our memory verse, our memory passage, verses 22 and 23 says, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Pulling them out of the fire. People are headed towards hell. When we have the proper understanding of what hell is, it should be a motivating factor to say, you know what, I don't want people to go there, and that's why we love our enemies. We don't even want our enemies to go to that place because it is really bad. We understand the truth about hell. It is a real place. It is horrible. It is worse than anything you could ever experience or understand in this lifetime. We know that it's real. And we have the truth of the gospel. And every time you come into contact with somebody and you might be thinking, wow, maybe I should give the gospel to this person. And think about how many times you don't. I want you, when you leave this morning, when you see a person and you don't know if they're saved or you know that they're not saved, I want you to think about how real hell is. And imagine that person weeping and wailing and burning and being tortured and tormented forever and ever and ever because you didn't open up your mouth and preach the gospel unto them. That should be motivation for us. That is real. That is serious. That is why we do what we do. That is the whole purpose that we are still here is to go out and bring the gospel to the lost. Now, you may not be able, you can't make anybody get saved, but you can at least do your best where you could say, you know what? I gave it my all. I tried my best. You know, if, at least now if they go to hell, there's at least more of an understanding. You know, the, the real tragedy is for the people that would have gotten saved if someone would have just opened up their mouth and loved them enough to tell them the truth. I don't dance around the subjects of hell. I don't leave them out of my preaching because I want everyone to come in in the morning and leave just feeling great. Because I want to teach the truth. I want you to be motivated. I want us to, to go out and serve God with the fullness of our soul and our spirit to go out and reach people because it's important. And this is the truth. And if you love someone enough, you're going to tell them the whole truth. You're not going to hold anything back from them. And when you, when you, when you love someone, you're going to tell them, hey, if they're, if they're not saved, if you don't have Jesus Christ, if, you're not, if, you don't, if your faith isn't in Christ, you're going to hell when you die. And it may not be polite. It may be taboo in today's society. But if you really love that person, you're going to tell them the truth. What's the point in having pleasantries and talking about the weather and everything nice when that person dies and goes to hell for an eternity? Now, I mentioned that, turn if you would to Romans chapter 8. We see that hell is not eternal separation from God. It's just not true. It's a false doctrine. But the good news is, is that once you're saved, nothing can separate you from God's love. Amen. Look at verse number 35 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. And you know what? That is the good news. We don't just go out preaching the bad news of hell. It's important. People need to understand that, that that is the consequence. But hey, there's good news. In light of all this bad news of an eternity of suffering and torture and hell, you could, you could forgo all of that. Amen. You could be forgiven. You could be saved. You could never face that again. Get the love of God. 
Put your faith in Jesus Christ and you will receive the love of God and nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from that. Whether you go off and commit murder, whether you commit adultery, whether you lie, whether you steal, whether you do anything, nothing can separate you from the love of God once your faith is in Christ and you're born again. Amen. Praise God for His eternal gift. I see the sun's coming out. We've got a soul winning time coming up at 2 o'clock. You know, you don't have to go soul winning with us, but don't be a Christian who never preaches the gospel. These times are set up so that, hey, there's a soul winning time. You could show up. If you've never given the gospel to someone before, if you don't feel very confident in being able to explain how to be saved, Come with us. We'll teach you how to do it. It's really easy, actually. And we'll show you the ropes. You come out with us. You could be a silent partner. You don't have to say anything. You could just see how we do it. You could just, just come along. Our job as Christians is to be ambassadors for Christ. We are, have been, it's been committed unto us, the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people unto God. It is our job to preach the gospel to every creature. And there are dire consequences if you are slack in that great commission. It's the difference between heaven and hell. You know, you could look at other things in your life and say, well, I know I'm supposed to do this, but what's the worst that could happen if I don't do this? So you could think about any, anything, any sin, anything in your life. You say, well, I'm going to reap what I sow. Okay. But it's really not that bad. I mean, you might, you might have these kind of thoughts. It's wicked thoughts. You shouldn't be thinking that. But when it comes to preaching the gospel to people, it's not just, oh, well, whatever, I'm just going to have this. No, someone's going to be suffering in hell forever. Someone that you could have reached. Yeah. The, the consequences are eternal. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful gift and, and the love that, that we will not be separated from as born-again believers. Dear God, help us to go out and preach the message. Preach, preach the message not to just gloss over or be preach a watered-down separation from God as a result of people's sins, but te tell people the truth that, look, they're headed towards hell. And it's not just because, you know, we're some great people and they're some horrible people and looking down our nose and having a holier-than-thou attitude, dear Lord, but that we all deserve hell because we're all sinners. Help us to be able to explain that and to explain the reality of hell to people and that the reality of hell will be real to us to motivate us to open up our mouths boldly and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, dear Lord, and to not just stop at the bad news, dear Lord, but to help to them to understand the great news, the good news, that uh, salvation is a free gift. And all they have to do is receive it, dear Lord. I pray that you would please stir up this church. I pray that you please build this church, build this congregation. Help us to have more laborers, dear Lord, that are willing to go out, that understand the importance, that understand the reality of hell, and want to see people saved from that eternal damnation, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.